Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Klaus. And hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, so I'm Greg, co-founder at undo.io, and we're going to talk today about time travel uh, debugging. So i am just got some slides that hopefully you can see here. Right. Yes. So let's start right at the beginning, the beginning of what we kind of think of as programming, right? So this chap here, Sir Morris Wilkes, has, I think, the best claim as anybody to being the world's first computer programmer because he was the first person to program like what you'd think of as a computer, a stored program, a uh, digital computer, to do a real job, right? Not just to prove that the machine worked. It was it was something to do with um, biology and genetics, I think. So it was here at, at Cambridge, where I'm based, where I'm talking to you from today. Um, and, and in his memoirs, he says that he will remember, clearly, the moment he realized that a good part of the remainder of his life was going to be spent finding errors in his own programs. And I, I have to say, I, I kind of remember that moment as well. When you first get, uh, 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 you know, you first get bitten by the bug, to use it, to mix the metaphors, but you first start programming, you realize, yeah, it's just really hard, uh, really hard to get it right. Now, of course, the term, <clears throat> the term debugging hadn't yet been uh, invented. That was invented, as uh, many people know, by uh, Grace Hopper when she found a bug, an actual bug, uh, in the machine that they were working on at the time. So actually, this story is not true. This is an apocryphal story. I love being pedantic, just like any good programmer does. And uh, it's, it's not true that the term um, bug and debugging was invented here. And on the right, you can see this is a copy from the notebook, the lab book that was taken at the time. And you can see this underneath the, the moth that's taped in, you can see it says the first actual case of a bug. Now, that would only work as a joke if the term bug was already in common usage, right? Doesn't make any sense if that's the invention of the word. And in fact, you can see Edison has uh, refers to debugging in his logbooks from you know sort of fifty years previously. But it was really uh, you know outside of the spy world, debugging is associated with with um, with computing and particularly with software because that's where you just get that's because it, the debugging process dominates just completely dominates software development, right? I mean, I think as a you know as, as an exercise. How many lines of code do you reckon you could type in and have work first time? Right. I, I like to think of myself as an OK programmer. I think, you know, 10, maybe if I'm really concentrating and it's kind of simple, 20 lines of code. Another, but uh, let's twist, let's turn up the, the, the level here. How many lines of code do you think you can change and have it work first time? Right. In existing code. I think that number is less than one, right? It's just, it just never works first time. And debugging, the process of debugging totally dominates software development. In fact, it's said, some people say that software development is in two parts. There's bugging and debugging, right? There's typing the code in and then there's making it work. And the typing is a relatively small portion of it. So, you know, that's why I kind of uh, you know, started the company doing doing what we do is it just it just seemed to me amazing actually that it's such an important part of software development and yet you know we spend we spend so little uh, uh sort of effort on it we don't teach it there's you know relatively very few uh companies doing stuff in it um there are course companies like my own there's there's lots of tools out there but when you compare to other parts of programming actually they're kind of rare there are more languages invented any say decade than you know than debugging tools, I think, which is quite something, right? Here's a here's a here's another quote, quote from Brian Kernigan, very wise chap. He says, you probably know this, this is quite well known. He says, everyone knows that debugging is twice as hard as writing a program in the first place. So if you're as clever as you can be when you write it, how will you ever debug it? Now, very pithy, funny kind of quote, you know, funny because it's true, but but it, it, it's a different way of looking at the world. I think pretty obviously what Kernigan means here is keep it simple and right? give yourself margin for error. Don't write the code as you, know, if you don't be as clever as you can be when you write the code. But I think there's an interesting kind of corollary to this, right? A, 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 a thing that follows from this, which is if you take this to be true, which I think it is, then the debuggability 
it's like the limiting factor in software development, right? So if you make the software, if you, if you can make software twice as debuggable, then like whatever your uh, whatever your metric for good is, maybe it's how fast the code runs, maybe it's how small it is, how quickly you can write it, how extensible it is. But whatever the metric for good is, if it's twice as debuggable, you can make it twice as good. It's the limiting factor. So I think this is kind of interesting. And so I think we need better and and, and smarter ways uh, to debug. So let's just think about this. And so how do we do so debugging dominates software development? And so what does that mean? Right? How what do we what, what do we mean by debugging? How do how do we debug most of the time? Well, sometimes we use um, you know dynamic checkers like Valgrid. Super useful, super cool tool. Um, probably the most significant uh, debugging kind of new brand new debugging tool to come out of the uh, the, 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 the 2000s in that decade. Um, but you know what? How often do we really debug debug using Valgrind? We might we might have Valgrind in in uh, in our in our CI pipeline, and um, you should we do at Undo. Um, but I'm talking about debugging as in like, oh, damn, the software's not done what I wanted to do. Let me find out what's wrong. And yeah, maybe you might you might suspect a stack overflow or something and so, or a buffer overrun. So yeah, let's run it through Valgrind and, and uh, maybe it gives us the answer. But how often do you really do that, right? I'm gonna say for most people, that's a, like a once a year type thing, right? Maybe even, maybe even less. Um, Maybe we use a debugger. They're going to debug. Let's use the debugger. Let's bring out GDB or Visual Studio, whatever your debugger of choice is. For most people, I would say that's more like a once a month activity. Like, you know, very approximate, some more, some less. But, but generally, you know, it's sort of a few times per year. Maybe, maybe a few times per month. Printf all the time every day, right? I reckon most developers spend most of their time debugging by adding printfs. Why Why is this? Why, why, when we have all this technology available, why is it that we spend most time doing debugging through printf? Well, I think there's a number of reasons for this. I think, uh, I think uh, uh, one of them, I mean, this is maybe kind of a, a controversial point, but I think one of the main reasons is that sometimes we're kind of lazy, right? And so I think we all know this cartoon from XKCD, um, uh, you know, a bit of a meme from a few years ago. Um, you can tell, obviously, it's pre-pandemic uh, times. But uh, but yeah, it, you know, oh yeah, we you know we're we're, we're compiling. Well, why are you why are you compiling? You're probably compiling because you added a printf, right? That's because that's what you know that printf debugging is. Add printf, compile, run, go around that loop. And even if I don't have a great big long compile time, still a relatively low, like it doesn't tax me that much, right? It's kind of comfortable, don't have to think too hard. And it's kind of, I think it's kind of the programmer's equivalent of reading email. I can convince myself that I'm being productive. I don't have to feel guilty. I'm at work, I'm working hard, but I'm not really working hard. I'm just, you know, sort of presenteeism, right? Adding a printer. So, I think you know programmers are lazy. Everyone's a bit lazy, right? We all like to, um, uh, you know, no one likes to admit it, but we all are. So that's one reason why we do printf. But it's not the only reason. There are other. There's other another really really important reason, uh, which is debugging is basically trying to figure out how did that happen, right? What just happened? What did my code actually do? Right? I don't mean how did that happen like that, right? I don't mean how did that happen. I mean, the program, I had a certain set of expectations when I was going to run my program. And 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 so I typed the code in or I changed that line of code and I expected this thing to happen. And when I ran the program, run through my tests or my CI or maybe even in production, reality has diverged from my expectations. And the process of debugging is like, where did that divergence happen? Actually, the divergence is often uh, a bit more like that, right? But so it's not easy to trace back from noticing the problem, right? So maybe it's an assertion failure, okay, or 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 uh, you know crash in some other way, um, or maybe it's like the dreaded bad result, right? And I have to trace back from what I'm seeing to where did where did reality diverge from my expectations? Which in the modern you know computing world, billions of instructions every second just on a single core. So 
you know, this is really a big you know, needle in a haystack challenge. And the the longer that's elapsed between the bug itself and me noticing, the harder the challenge is, right? And that's why, by the way, uh, crashes and assertion failures are quite good. Like when there's assertion failure, you're kind of usually much closer to the problem. When it's bad results, that's always the worst, right? Because it could happen anywhere in my program's execution. Greg, we do we do have a question. Yeah. And it's it's more like a mixture of statement and question, but I believe it's uh, it would be nice if you could comment on that. So Roy is asking or stating that perhaps the prevalence of printf is because it's done while developing. Later on, when the bug is found, we might not remember how the code should behave. So yes, absolutely. I I I, I completely agree with that statement. It, it's it's um uh, the only thing I would the only thing I would kind of pick on in that statement or, or to maybe change is I don't think there's a separation between developing and debugging, right? I think it's bugging and debugging. It's all part of you know the inner loop debugging, you know, it, it's all part of development. But still, yeah, sometimes when we're doing that, and by the way, I think that's one of the reasons why debugging gets like massively overlooked as to how important it is, because it's like, oh, I'm not debugging right now, I'm doing development. Well, mm -hmm. unless, I mean, <laughs> I can tell you a story of a guy I used to work with who was brilliant um and and grew up uh on um grew up on punch card machines right he's retired now and we work on a project this is early in the company actually we work on this big pro big project biggest deal the company had ever signed it was going to check sort of change everything um really get us kind of off the ground and it was a multi-month project and we've been in for three months how are you getting on i asked him how are you getting on he said yeah doing quite you know it's going quite well i'm, I'm seeing kind of on target uh, a little bit behind maybe six months in how are you getting on? Yeah, it's, you know, it's getting there. We're kind of nearly there. I'm kind of think I'm sort of 90% of the way through. He said, mind you, I haven't tried to compile it yet. <laughs> and I was like, what? I'm like building the company on this. And that was just amazing. And then a bit later, he said, right, okay, yeah, I've tried to compile it. Yeah, there were some compile errors and then I fixed those and then there were a couple of bugs and I fixed those and now it's done, right? And that was just because he'd grown up writing code on punch cards. But that's not how anybody develops software anymore, right? We are we are always typing it in, debugging it, typing it in, debugging it. But that like, little journey in, uh, aside, uh, yeah, I completely agree. The printf tells us, this is exactly my point, the printf tells us what happened, right? And GDB, or Visual Studio debugger, regular debuggers, don't tell you what happened. Oh, okay, well, maybe there's a backtrace, right? Which is kind of as close as you can get. But the backtrace is like a tiny sliver. It's, just, it's a tiny fraction of everything that happened. They don't tell you what happened. Printf tells me what happened. That's why it's really useful, right? Okay, yeah, thank you, great. So, so uh, uh, yeah, but you know, nonetheless, Printf tells me what happened, but it is a needle in a haystack problem. I'm trying to find that one bad line of code that maybe you know executed billions of lines of code have executed between where I am and where I'm trying to find out what went wrong. So it's quite amazing that we debug anything actually, I think, when you when you consider kind of quite how complex it is. Amazing that anything works at all. Uh, and that when it doesn't we manage to get to the bottom of it. Um, but uh, um, but I think we can, you know, point of this talk is we can do better. Um, we can time travel. Right. So if I want to know what happened, wouldn't it be better to go back in time to wherever I wanted in my program's execution. I mean, obviously I'm usually talking about going back milliseconds or seconds, maybe minutes or hours, but you know, go back in time and see what happened. So time travel like, so this is HG Wells um, time machine um, or the movie thereof. And it's that it's actually when you say time travel debugging, it's this kind of time travel, right? Which is, this was more of a, he was more of a spectator in this story, unlike more kind of contemporary time travel stories where people tend to go back and change history, right? Because that's you know, I guess that's interesting, but um, but uh, of course it creates you know grandfather paradox and 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 and, and all of this. But this, so think, think of when I say time travel, I mean the ability just to go back and see exactly what was happening, not necessarily interfere with the flow of time. But that's what I need. That's what I need when I'm debugging. I need to go back and see what happened. So let's that's enough slides. Let's let's show what this actually uh, what this actually looks like. So I am going to uh, I think which one am I going to show? I've got a couple of demos that I want to show. They're both sort of a little bit different. Um, and uh, I think I'm going to show the I'm going to show 
uh, this one first, which is a bit more kind of command line-y. So um, let's uh, make this just nice and big so we can all see this uh, uh, screen. So I have here uh, a program. Let's look at it, which is just a, it's a bubble sort. It's a bit, bit of C code, super simple. You know, basic computer science 101 bubble sort. Um, and uh, the main function just like gets an array, 32 entries, randomizes it, and then sorts it. Okay, it's all the program does. It doesn't even print anything out. And so uh, when I run the program like this, it's just created that random memory and sorted it. That's fine. Right? I happen to know that this program uh, contains uh, a bug. So if I put, if I run this, in a loop like this, every so often, it's quite rare. Oh, there we go. That was quite quick today. That's crashed. Cool dump. Okay, fine. Let's have a look at the. Let's have a look at this. So, uh, I've got. Uh, oh, let's, I'm just running four, two. So this is the core file we've just uh, created. Okay, let's um, let's go even bigger. Just in case, sometimes it's small looking. So let's load that up into uh, GDB. So this is a core file. So this is a snapshot of the program's execution at the point that it failed, right? Obviously, terminated with segv, fine. So what do we do? We want to see what happened, right? So backtrace, because that tells us what happened. Well, not this time it doesn't, right? Back stack's garbage. I mean, sometimes the stack is legit. We'll see a demo in a minute. It's not just when the stack is garbage, but it's just a nice illustration that uh, that hasn't helped me. So I need to run that. I'm going to run that in uh, a time travel Debugger. Now, there's a number of different time travel debuggers out there. There's stuff for Windows. There's a couple of options on Linux where where we work. But if you'll forgive me, the kind of self promotion. Let's show. Um, let's show. Uh, let's show our time travel debugger UDB. Right. So it's just like GDB, but it's got time travel capability. So actually, GDB does have some time travel capability, but we'll talk about that a bit. It's kind of slow. So run the program um, as normal. Uh, and uh, there we go, it ran completely, it ran to completion, start again. Now this is gonna get boring, I don't want to do this again and again and again. So I am going to, uh, I'm gonna put a breakpoint um, on exit. I'm gonna add some commands. So this is just some GDB hackery that uh, that you can do. You can add commands to execute whenever a breakpoint happens. And I'm gonna just rerun. And um, I'm gonna set confirm off because I don't want it to keep asking me. And I'm gonna run. So this is just gonna run again and again and again. You can see we're going around. And um, uh, oops, I want to want to do set pagination off as well, and uh, we'll do that again. And we just keep running this. Oh, great! Right, it's failed. So uh, didn't get to the exit, right? It got a seg fee. Um, so look at the backtrace. That's like you know pretty similar to what we saw before, right? I seem to be you know, in a corrupt, corrupted stack. So um, I'm just going to go here layout source so we can see a little bit more going on. There's no source here. I'm just going to be in some sort of hyperspace. I'm going to do a reverse step i, right? So you hopefully know the step i instruction in the command in GDB, right? Step a single instruction. So reverse step i is going to take me back in time one instruction. But hey, look, now I'm back in sensible land, right? Back into my program's return statement. Now that's not that surprising given it looked like I had um, a bogus stack. So now like backtrace, well, I'm only one function feature. Everything looks much better here. I can look. This is this is um this is just you know, GDB so interface. So I can look at the uh, the the stack pointer. So I'm I'm expecting stack corruption. So that's my stack pointer. And if I look at uh, long star star of that, um, so that's the return address, right? So when I return, oh, by the way, let's go. Let's look at the assembly code here. So I'm at the return instruction, x86 ret instruction. And so what I was going to do is pop the top level on the stack. So what stack pointer points to is going to be the return address, this value here, OX4B, blah, blah, blah. So let's look at the memory there. So if I disassemble that, that should be what I return to. Oh, OK, no function there. Let's examine the memory. It's invalid, right? That's a bad address, right? That is a, that's garbage on the top of my stack. So. Hmm, let's get back. Uh, let's get back to the previous uh, view, which I kind of want to get to. See if I can figure that out. Right. So, top of my stack contains garbage. Something's written garbage into the top of my stack. I need to know how did that happen, right? 
Um, and that's often the case when we're debugging, it's sometimes about what line of code, but it's usually about the data, right? It's usually my data's caused me to go in a, in a, in a bad direction. And here, well, the stack is data, right? And the stack is garbage. So I'm going to issue, uh, uh, what, um, uh, there's a bit of a killer feature of time travel debugging, which is the reverse watch point, right? So I want to watch the top of the stack. So I'm going to watch like this. It's the simplest way to do this, right? So that's the stack pointer. That watch is going to watch the top of the stack. So set a watch point. And so we want to set a watch point. If you're more used to Visual Studio, it's called a data breakpoint. Um, but a basic idea is I'm going to, you know, can run until that data changes. But I'm not going to run forwards until the data changes, of course. I'm going to run backwards, right? So reverse continue is going to move back in time until that top of the stack changed. So here I have gone back in time. I've gone back. Oh, look, I'm writing into the array here. Print i. i is 35. That's a suspiciously large value because I think I saw that my array has only 32 elements. And of course, because here's the bug, because I've gone percent size of array. That's the size of the array in bytes, not the size of the array in elements. So this is obviously a tiny, tiny program just to demonstrate um, to demonstrate time travel debugging. Um, but the point, but this actually uh, this scales. Now I can do tiny values. Tiny, the inbuilt GDB process record it's called will do tiny programs like this, but it won't scale to anything really much bigger than this at all. Um, but uh, modern time travel debuggers uh, will, and they'll they'll scale up to some of the largest, most complex. So we have customers who run programs that are like literally. Ter literally terabytes of working set and run times of days, right? And everything kind of in between. Um, uh, uh, and so that's just to, but those are kind of hard to demonstrate. So that was a GDB style interface. I want to show you another demo now, which is a bit, a little bit more kind of um, um, visual. Um, and so it might be a little bit easier on the eye. Same kind of concepts, but just in a different way. And I'm going to show you how also how it can be integrated into one's uh, CI. So I am going to here go to our internal GitHub uh, at, uh, uh, at undo. And here are some pull requests and um, uh, that I've made. And a bunch of them have failed, because they always do, because I find it really hard to write code, as discussed. And uh, here's the one I want to show you today. So this is a pull request. Let me make this a little bit bigger. Uh, so it made a pull request in GitHub. It fired off some chests in Jenkins because, you know, that's what happens, right? Um, and they failed because, yeah, that's what happened too. So let's see the details. This is going to take me into Jenkins. And, um, yeah, I've got some test failures. And um, I can take, uh, let's take this one. So let's zoom in again so we can see it. So all kind of normal, right? So my Jenkins test has failed. I've got a bunch of output. This is log, the log of what was going on. This is my printf debugging, right? Now, if I'm lucky in my log from my test run, I already have the, uh, I already have the, the uh, enough evidence to know what's gone wrong. But I can tell you here, like, I don't, I just know this assertion has failed. I don't have enough information in the log. And that's usually the case, right? Usually we're going to have to get some more information. We're going to have to run again um, with another, you know, more printf or whatever it is. But we've got here an integration to what we call the observatory. So let's go to that. And this contains the, this is another view basically onto the artifacts. And this is a recording, uh, a recording of that test. So I'm going to click on that. What that's going to do is in our CI system, load that recording up. So recording is like a, a headless, uh, a headless recording um, uh, of the, of the execution that I can then like offline debug later that day, tomorrow, next week, whenever, right? So this is loading up now. Um, um, just give me a little, uh, 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 you know, uh, read me type thing, but uh, we're not getting into all of that. So it's going to load up this recording of the test that failed some time ago when I when I made that pull request and it, and it executed all of the tests. So if you know VS Code, this will look familiar. This is a kind of VS Code uh, in the browser uh, 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 interface and let me just resize this a little bit. Um, and yeah, well, here we are. Look, an assertion this is the assertion that I saw fail in the log. And um, let's get rid of that message. So it tells me 
square root correct is 15 and square root cash is zero. So, right, that's why the assertion failed. But what happened, right? Well, I can just look a couple of lines up and I can see a called cash calculate um, with number, number of 255. And that function returned zero. And look, it's I can see it looks like it's supposed to be the square root. So this function cash calculate is supposed to return the square root of whatever um, number I pass in. And uh, yeah, it, it obviously hasn't. So cash calculate has returned the wrong thing and I need to know why. Now, so far, if I'd configured my CI system to uh, store a core file, I could get most of this experience, right? I could load the core file in, I could look up the stack, I can see some local variables. But I stop here. I can't, the core file wouldn't help me anymore, right? Because I need to know why did cache calculate return what it did? And that information is like gone, right? That information is gone from, from history from looking at a core file. But I'm not looking at a core file. I'm looking at uh, uh, I'm looking at a recording. And so I have the full information. In fact, what I have access to here is every single line of code that executed and every single piece of data at every single line of code that executed. I can see everything about what my program has done. If I look here, I'm going to just, just move this up a little bit so get a bit more. You can see this is actually a multi-threaded program. And this is thread number 10 out of 11 where it stopped. And I can see actually it's not actually stopped here. It's stopped inside the C library where there is no debug information. So VS Code's been kind of nice and put me at the place in the call stack where it has some information. But I want to get back to here. So I'm going to hit this button, reverse step out, which is kind of like, you know, I think of this as uncall, right, or a reverse finish. So click that, and it's going to go watch this, watch the call stack here. It's going to unwind up the call stack to, let's put that back up so we can see what's going on. One more. And now I'm at my code here. And now I can start to, by the way, when I, um, Let's just move this down a bit. When I when I step back through time, you'll see the data. The data, here's the local data and local variables. As I step back, you can see the data change. So step. Okay, so now I'm right after cash calculate returned. And I want to know why did cash calculate return the wrong thing. So I'm going to reverse step into that function and see what it did. Step, step. Okay, so hmm, returning, it's got a cash hit here. It's returned from the cash. And so this is like uh, typically a uh, kind of bad day at the office when you see this, right? But let's just see a little bit what's going on. So it's returning the ith entry from the cache. I is 90. And uh, yeah, I can look at this. Uh, whoops, I can look at this data. So G cache, mind you, a by the way, a watch in, this is confusing, but a watch in VS Code is what Visual Studio calls a watch, which is like display in GDB, if we're used to that. It's nothing to do with watch points. So that terminology is a bit sad, but anyway. Um, let's have a look at the 90th entry in the cache. Yeah, okay, that's, if you remember, that was the problem. It, the function returned zero when it was passed 255 as a parameter. Um, and yeah, my cache is bad, right? My cache contains corrupted data. So yeah, as I said, this is a bad day at the office, right? Is this all I, you know, what happened? How did that happen? Was that a logic error? Is it a pointer error? Is it a threading error? I don't, all I know is that at some point in my program's history, something wrote bad data into my data structure. Um, well, I can see here, look, I've got a shed yield and a mutex lock and everything. So maybe there's some sort of threading issue. So let's go back a few lines. So back, back, back. Right now, this is the beginning of this line. So now I've gone back to before the mutex unlock and nope, cache is still bad. So maybe it's not a threading problem. Um, well, what I'm going to do is just uh, uh, let's do it this way. I'm going to put another uh, watch point, right? We're going to do one of these uh, reverse watch points again. So uh, watch G cache NT. Um, I want to, I'm going to uh, set that uh, watch point. And now again, I'm going to hit this reverse. Uh, reverse continues, go back in time. So I guess a reverse watch point. So I want to know when did that data structure change? So click, okay, gone back in time. I've hit the watch point and uh, look, do look to be in, uh, uh, that's interesting. Okay, this time I'm in the same thread. Usually this ends up in a different thread, but there's a little bit of randomization in this. Um, so um, definitely, well, not looking like a threading problem. 
Let me uh, now disable that watch point. It just makes the flow a bit better. So what's going on? I'm midway through the update to this structure. I've just written a number adjacent in. So let's just go uh, back a line. So this is before I started updating. So this is the line of code. This is kind of the smoking gun. Um, and yeah, look, cache 90 says the square root of 40 is 6. And that's with integers. That's correct. So this looks like kind of pretty close now. So I'm going to step forwards line by line. And if you, as you watch, hopefully it's not too small here, you can see the data. Watch the data here in the structure as I step forward. This is like watching uh, action replay if you're watching sports on the TV, right? So I'm going to step forwards, line by line, step, step. That's it. That's the corruption happening right there. Let's come back a bit um, see what's going on. So we're writing number adjacent, negative one, and square root adjacent. Garbage. I seem to be taking the square root of minus one. And so that's that's just rubbish, right? Can't do that with integers. Why did that happen? Right, so it's a repeated process. And why did that happen? Typical debugging session. Um, well, and why is number adjacent minus one? Well, I actually starting I'm getting pretty close now, but you know, let's use let's keep using the text. So let's put another watch point. Y is number adjacent. Oop, I'll do it with the U here. Y is number adjacent, negative one. Okay, it's being set here. Number adjacent is being set, hasn't been initialized yet. It's being set to number minus one, and number is zero. So here's my bug, right? I called the function with a parameter of zero. It returned the right thing. It returned zero. But as a side effect, it left an entry in my cache in a bad state because it was trying to be clever, trying to do a bit of uh, populating the cache either side on the basis of some kind of locality of reference. And one of those was bogus. And I didn't notice until my program had executed for some time later and it tripped over the assertion. So two very small examples, trivial examples are small enough to show in a demo, but you know, you can hopefully see the power of this. This is actually a canned, uh, a canned demo of the real world um, uh, bug we did with a customer of ours. This is all public information, custom, uh, cadence, right? The chip design people. And um, you know they have some very complex software that runs for a very long time in some cases. Um, and uh, this particular issue, the software was crashing at, at one of Cadence's biggest customers after eight hours of execution, about one run in three hundred. And so that you know that thing I was showing about the reality diverging from expectations, that was just super hard, right? One run in three hundred after eight hours, it would always crash in a different way. They'd look up a core, they get a core file, they'd look at the core file, there was a negative one in memory where there should have been a pointer. And it was just always different when it did fail. And so they had engineers, Cadence had engineers on site with their customer trying to debug this issue for three months. And they were just getting nowhere because there just wasn't the information in the core file or in the logs, couldn't add enough printfs. So uh, that's when they tried, uh, they tried undo's live recorder. They ran, um, uh, just left it running with recording and just left it running again and again and again. Uh, actually, over the weekend, they came in, um, a bunch of machines running all weekend. They came in on Monday morning. Sure enough, some of the, a couple of them failed, loaded a recording, put a reverse watch point just like that and ran back in time. So, and had the issue fixed in three months, three hours. Sorry, they went from three months. Actually, they went from infinite time because they were getting nowhere in three months to three hours issue revolt, result. So that's a kind of example of the power of time travel debugging. But you can see how if you have it in your CI, actually, you know, it's maybe not so high profile, um, but continually turning those afternoon debug sessions into 10 minutes. And that kind of, in some ways, is even more powerful because the, 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 the benefits kind of uh, compound. So there we go with a couple of uh, demos. Well, my, oh, my slides are back here. So, um, um, and, perhaps I can um, interrupt you at this I, point. You know, Sorry, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. So uh, because we have a good question uh, of Anton, he's a little interested in how things work under the cover. Mm. So the question is, does UDB record the execution similar to RR to be able to travel back in time? Yeah. Right, so let me, yeah, yeah let me get, uh, 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 that's an excellent question because it's exactly what I want to talk about right now. So let's okay. get into, um, uh, quick answer is yes, it is similar to RR, but let's get into how this um, right. how this works. So yeah, let's talk about, so, Different implementations. So I just told you, you know, some of our stuff because you know, it's I'm I'm biased, right? But um, uh, yeah, for depending on what you know, programming language and what platform you're using, there's various different implementations of time travel debugging today. I would say 
really it's an idea whose time has come. Um, uh, there's uh, RR, which stands for Record and Replay, which we run debugging C++ or Go code on Linux is, um, it's open source, it's, it's there, it's in most of the distros and uh, it's a good piece of tech, it's fast um, and uh, uh, works very well. Um, it, there are areas where it can't work. Um, so if your program has uh, shared memory, so shared with the kernel or asynchronous IO or shared with the device or another process, um, it, it's not able to record that. It, it, it can't work on sort of multi-tenant cloud machines because it's reliant on the performance counters. But uh, it, where it works, it works very well. Um, GDB process record, I, met, I alluded to that earlier. That is, um, uh, uh, to be honest, not so good. Um, it's uh, not really super well maintained. It is just there in GDB in every version since seven. So it's quite, can be convenient, but it's super slow. We'll get into a, a why in just a moment. Um, uh, often on Windows, Microsoft um, are investing heavily in time travel debugging. So they've got their time traveler, time travel debugger um, for C++ and for C Sharp uh, as part of Visual Studio um, and as part of uh, WinDebug. Um, uh, and uh, RevDebug, which is another kind of startup company uh, focusing on C Sharp and, and Java on the Windows space in the browser for front end stuff. There's a, a very exciting new company, replay.io, um, who are doing that, you know, for your JavaScript um, debug from the from the browser. And uh, there are also hardware-based solutions for embedded, I haven't said here, but but uh, Green Hills Time Machine and Lauterbach uh, uh, Deep, uh, Trace 32 debugger will use, if you've got the hardware support, um, uh, will, will um, they're, they're, they're very good as well. So lots of different uh, uh, implementations, depending on exactly uh, what kind of code you're working on and what you need to do. And there are various terms for this, right? So time travel debugging, that seems to be what people are kind of coalescing around, I think probably because Microsoft's put a big push behind it. Um, and so I think that's kind of where we're sort of stabilizing as, as terminology, but it variously called reversible debugging, bidirectional debugging and replay debugging, all basically the same thing. Um, um, and uh, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about how actually it works. Um, I think we're going over times. Well, no, we were all right for time. So, yeah. How, so, how does it? How does this work? What? Well, you know, what happened? That's the question we're trying to answer, right? Um, and that's why time travel debugging is super cool because it can answer that question. Well, why? Another way of saying that, slightly more kind of precise, computer sciencey way of saying that is what was the previous state? Right? When I'm stopped in my debugger at you know a line of code at a breakpoint or whatever. I want to go back a line. I want to know. I need to know what the previous state was, right? There are some solutions, by the way, that'll give you kind of half of time travel debugging in that they'll tell you what lines of code were executed, but they can't show you the data. And I think that doesn't really count as time travel debugging if you can't see the data. So what was the previous state? So how am I going to do that? Well, it's not as easy as it might first sound, and that's kind of the reason why these things, you know, are only just really becoming a thing. Um, whoops. So how am I going to do that? Right. How am I going to work out what was the previous state? Well, I've really, I've got I've got kind of two uh, uh, two options. I can I can save it as I go. I can save each prior state, um, or I can recompute the prior states. So GDB process record works by saving the st as every instruction that executes is, it saves just the delta, just the bits of memory that changed, but that's still like super slow and uses loads of memory because billions of instructions every second. Every instruction is going to change some state. If it doesn't, you're in a, an infinite loop. You've, you've live locked. So every instruction is going to save some piece of state, change some piece of state. So that's gigabytes and gigabytes per second, right? But also actually not because it goes super slow. So better to recompute, better to figure out what the previous state was than just save it. Um, that performs much better, both in terms of uh, execution time and uh, overheads, your space overheads required. Um, but it's not so easy to recompute it. Computing generally is not reversible, right? So, okay, if I've got a statement like this, a equals a plus one, I can compute what the previous value of a, and I know what a is, I can compute the previous value pretty easily, right? But what if I've got that kind of statement? Okay, what was, if I know the value of a and I know the value of b, I can't know the value of a previously, it's gone, right? That piece of information doesn't exist in the universe anymore. And, and unless 
and I've saved it, or unless I've got some way to recompute it. In fact, even the first one there, A equals A plus one, not so easy to compute what the previous state was because the machine, the CPU probably has a flags register, something like that, right? And that's probably, you don't know what that was previously, like was the zero flag set before or not? I mean, I don't know, right? So, so, so computing, just running the program backwards doesn't really work. There is a, an interesting field of research called reversible logic where actually you make it so the hardware can reverse and that has interesting um, potential for low power computing as well because there's equations that relate information to power and destruction of information consumes power. But like, you know, that's like quantum computing type stuff, right? It's a long way away if it if it ever happens at all. And modern machines, you 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 can't just pick figure out what it was. So how do we do that? Well, you can't run the program backwards, but you can run the program again, right? And so this is based on you know this is our stuff. RR is is, is kind of has the same fundamental kind of design philosophy. Microsoft time travel debugging is a bit different, but but um, uh, yeah, basically working. You can't run it backwards, but you can run it again. So if I run a program multiple times, and every time I run it, I give it the same starting state, and I feed it the same set of inputs as it runs, it will do the same thing, right? The computers are naturally deterministic. This is why random numbers are difficult. Genuinely, random numbers are difficult to generate, right? Because then computers are sort of designed to be deterministic. So yeah, five. When I'm in the demo there and I stepped back a line of code, what was happening underneath was we were picking up a snapshot from some point in the past and playing that forward almost the same spot and stopping just one line previously. Right? And that gives the illusion of time travel. Then we have snapshots uh, that um, uh, mean that you know you don't have to go right back to the beginning and play it all the way forward. And we can build those on top of the Linux copy on write. Um, facility that that fork and clone and things are built on top of. So uh, it's pretty efficient. Snapshots are nice and efficient to take because they're copy on write and um, you know navigating through time. You saw it can can feel kind of instantaneous. Um, and so that is um, that's essentially you know how it works. Now the problem is that computers are completely deterministic except when they're not, right? And I said earlier, if I get the same program and I run it with the same inputs, then it'll do the same thing. It's true, but I have to give it, it's the, the same inputs, those few words, that's the bit that's really hard because they've got to be exactly the same. And those inputs might be, you know, reading from the network or reading from a file and relatively easy to intercept those kind of system calls and just store the results in an event log. And then when I'm replaying through history, I don't really read from that file. I just look at my event log and I write into that buffer in my program, whatever I read the first time round, right? But uh, it's not just reading from the file system that's a problem or reading off the network, or in fact, any system call. Any system call is sort of inherently non-deterministic or likely to be, because if you could predict the result of a system call based on the program state, then it probably wouldn't be a system call. It would probably be a library. Um, so pretty much every system call is, is um, needs the results of that need to be recorded. But I also have things like asynchronous signals, I have thread switches. I have uh, some instructions are non-deterministic, actually. So read the timestamp counter, or modern CPUs often have a read random number instruction. So like they're definitely non-deterministic. Um, and uh, and access is to share memory as well. So most memory has a kind of property that when I read from it, when I read back is what I most recently wrote. It's the definition of memory, right? But if my memory is shared and being DMA'd to by the system or written by another process, and when what I read may not be what I most recently wrote. And so those need to go into the event log as well. But basically we can capture all of those sources of non-determinism, put them in the event log, and then guarantee that um, that re-execution. And the nice thing about that, by the way, is you can replay not on the original machine, not even on the original network. I can take a recording you know, on a, of a machine that's in a completely different environment, and that recording is completely self-contained because it contains all of the inputs. And I can take that, and run that, you know, in a, on a different network, in a, di in a different machine, even with a different version of the operating system, because it's not making any system calls when I when I replay it. Um, so that's it. Um, I just want to uh, make a plug here for the GDB Watchpoint resource that uh, that I'm running, which is just gives you lots and lots of your if you're debugging on Linux with regular GDB, you know, 
so useful to everybody. You don't need to, certainly don't need to be a customer of ours. Um, all kinds of tips and tricks. There's a lot to GDB. I do a number of talks on on GDB and everything. Um, all the kind of amazing things that you can do with it. It's a very under uh, appreciated uh, uh, piece of technology, in my view. Um, but yeah, that's that's it. I'm, are there any more questions? So thanks a lot for the talk. I believe this was pretty fascinating indeed. And I do have a question from Ofek, who is actually asking about another product, a product that uh, by VMware that was called Replay. Yes. You that, and apparently it was discontinued in 2011. Yeah, yeah. Why? Yeah, that's right. So, so, so yeah, VMware had a Replay capability that was... Um, so, so it's actually, it's interesting just to touch on... Um, well, I'll get up to that in a minute. So yeah, so uh, yeah, that unfortunately was um, was uh, was discontinued as part of um, VMware Workstation. The, there are a couple of um, uh, challenges with it, um, but actually, one of the main things, very sadly, the chief architect of that died suddenly, um, and I think and I think that team kind of never quite got it um, back. Yeah. But um, um, also, it was a VM-based solution, so that has pros and cons. Um, but you know, it does, and um, gen usually what someone wants to debug is the process, not the VM. Okay, <laughs> thanks for the answer. Then, there is, um, oh, by the way, but there is something sort of, I guess, it's the new, there is something fairly relatively recently added to the Kimu, um, you know, VM emulator system, which does time travel, which is so that's kind of perhaps the the, the, the modern version of that. All right. So then, um, allow me to take over yep. to remind everybody about our... Okay, no, sorry. Indeed, I should have waited for a few more seconds. So <laughs> let me bring your slides up again. So there's another question. Um, do you record uninitialized data as well? Mm -hmm. That is, if I read from an uninitialized value, which may be the bug, will that uninitialized value be the same when replaying? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, because we're taking snapshots, right? And they're complete snapshots of the um, of the of the system memory. Um, and so there's that kind of initial snapshot, intermediate snapshot. So an uninitialized value in terms of like, so this works at the, this works at the machine level, right? In instructions and system calls. And that's, mm -hmm. The you know Microsoft time travel us even replay.io which is a JavaScript thing actually what it's recording is down on that kind of machine level turns out to be the right place to do it um, and at the machine level there is no uninitialized memory right it's like it's just memory and it has a value it might be zero might not be zero yeah. but you know so yeah uh, basically that just work, that works just fine all right perfect now here's another question by Roy uh, can you speak a little about the size of the recording? Mm. Uh, of a long running session. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, well, yeah, I, 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 so uh, the uh, somewhat kind of politician's answer is it depends, but it really does depend a lot. So, um, uh, because if you recall, what I said is we're recording the inputs to the program. And so if your program is calculating pi to like, you know, a billion mm -hmm. decimal places, then the recording is going to be tiny because it's all compute bound. There is very little input. If your program is reading 10 gigabit network stream um, you know, or uncompressed high definition video or something, then the recordings are going to get very big very quickly because there's lots of input to record. Yeah. But in general, most programs, typically what you're looking at is kind of on the order of a few megabytes per second. And typical recording size, usually some number of gigabytes is generally what we see. Sometimes we see terabyte size recordings, sometimes we see tiny recordings, but typically gigabytes. So quite manageable. Okay, so I, I believe this is actually also a question to um, the question of uh, Katerina. Hopefully this is correct. So uh, how big is the memory consumption typically with reference to original programs yeah. memory use? Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, then there's yeah. another question by. Right, I just want to go and an, 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 a slight, even less kind of politician answer. The memory, so there's, a, so that's the record. I was talking here about the recording size, a few gigabytes. Yeah. The memory requirements as you're recording, like the runtime memory requirements, 
generally what we say is uh, 2x is a, is a good rule of thumb. So if your program needs 100 megabytes you, to run normally, you kind of want to have another 100 megabytes free in your, in your mm -hmm. system. That's a good, good rule of thumb. All right, then um, Rabian asks, what is the performance penalty for running recordings? Yeah. And again, it, 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 it varies, but um, uh, uh, kind of typical kind of range is sort of 2x to 5x kind of slowdown. So, you know, it might run at half speed. Can be can be better than that, um, can be worse, depending on exactly what your program is doing. Um, so, um, but yeah, the, yeah, so it's like in some ways when you consider what you get, it's very small. I mean, you only, if you've got 2x slowdown, then you just need to save one rerun of your program and you win. Um, and uh um, but you know, it's kind of, it's not really designed. None of these are designed really to just turn them on all the time in production and leave them recording, like just in case, like some kind of, you know, aircraft flight recorder. They're more like, I've got a problem. It's happened again. So in our CI, for example, where I showed you our CI example, we, um, we've configured the CI to when a test fails, it'll rerun with recording and see if it can reproduce that failure. Um, or if we have flaky tests, they just run all the time with recording to try to get the, try to get the recordings out. Um, but yeah, so you know, two x to five x that kind of range is 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 typical. By the way, worth saying. So you know, on a very tight bound sort of real time system, obviously that can be a problem. Um, most real time systems have enough kind of headroom. And you know what's really bad for a real time system is regular debugging where you hit a breakpoint, right? And now you know your response is in human times. Yeah. So now I think we have another very interesting question by Jan. Um, I'm wondering if time trial debugging can help find race conditions, since these yep. will not always occur the same way when running forward from a snapshot. Ah, right, but they will. That's the that's the okay. trick. They will occur exactly the same way when running from the snapshot. Now, that's tricky to do, right? That's that's mm -hmm. kind of part of why you know this 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 tech is not easy to pull off. But yeah, we basically intercept enough of the thread switches and thread interactions to guarantee that replaying from the snapshot will do exactly the same thing. So race conditions is one of the kind of, um, you know, it's a, it's one of the most common applications that, uh, you know, that we do, that, that, that we used um, mm -hmm. for, you know, heavily multi-threaded code, very difficult to debug. Um, and, um, you know, becomes like, you know, super easy when you get a, when you get a recording. That's fascinating. Okay. Um, Anton has two questions. So I'm uh, reading the first one. How different is UDB from RR? Yes. Um, so uh, the, the, there are um, a number of differences. The main, um, the biggest difference is that, biggest single difference is that um, uh, the RR implementation. So one of the things that's hard, surprisingly hard about this is you need to know, you need to have a very precise notion of how far through the execution am I, right? So mm -hmm. to give a trivial example, if my program has a SIG alarm that comes in every second, then I need to replay that SIG alarm at exactly the right point. Otherwise, I'll diverge on, 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 on my replay, right? Yep. Actually, it's even worse than that. If you think about, imagine stepping back through a loop, right? So I've had a loop that's iterated 100 times, I'm stepping back one line in it. When I go back to the snapshot, it's probably before the loop was started. That mm -hmm. snapshot better stop it exactly 100 times around the loop, just one line earlier. So knowing exactly where you are in the program's execution is kind of a key piece of the underlying technology. And, and RR does that by using performance counters on modern Intel uh, CPUs mm -hmm. and some other CPUs, which are um, sort of sufficiently precise to do that. They count how many... Uh, instructions have, have been uh, executed. Actually, how many branches have been retired? Uh, we don't do that. We ours is based on um, runtime instrumentation, so we'll jit the code as it runs. It's completely transparent. You don't see it, but we mm -hmm. kind of translate the code into something that's functionally equivalent, but enough for us to get our um, fingers in. And so that has trade offs, right? And one of the big trade offs is, is like it's just a whole bunch of uh, it's much more complex, a whole bunch of code to to write. And that's definitely a negative. Um, uh, and uh, it can, depending on the application, does, it does depend on the application, but it can be a little bit slower. They're usually not that much between RR and, and UDB, but sometimes sometimes UDB is faster, but sometimes it can be slower because of that instrumentation overhead. Um, but the big thing is I can run it in a whole bunch of different places, right? So mm -hmm. those performance counters are not available always, 
if I've got a multi-tenant cloud machine, for example, you know, good paranoia around side channel attacks and the rest, that they're, they're not they're not generally available. So so RR can't work there, whereas uh, this can. The other another big thing is um, shared memory. So um, mm -hmm. because we've got the instrumentation, because we're built on binary instrumentation, we're able to kind of um, we're able to uh, I'm going to get into the details, but we're able to deal with memory that changes under the program execution. So shared memory, asynchronous I/O, that kind of stuff. Um, and then as a, I mean, I'm not going to get to like a feature list. There's quite a long feature list of, you know, you, you know, the thing with the table and the crosses and the ticks, and I won't get into that, but, but there's a number of features where, um, you know, where, where the two products are, are, are different, but the main difference really, I think is where they can be run, what kind of machines they can, they can run on. All right. So that was the second part of Anton's question, which I now delay in favor of Florian's question. Um, do you plan support for Windows for your solution? Nope. No. Um, okay. <laughs> Short answer. Uh, yeah, no. It, it, it's um, it would basically it, it, yeah. There are there are a number of technical reasons. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it would be a lot of work. Um, and uh, uh, I'm not sure that it even really would work. So, um, but Microsoft have a really good product. Microsoft have the Microsoft Time Travel Debugger, and mm -hmm. um, you know, like. They own that whole kind of stack, and 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 you know, so there's a, a good business reasons as well to kind of leave that to them. Um, uh, the it, well, just going into a little bit of technical detail here, just in case it's interesting. The um, the Microsoft product actually works a bit differently. The Microsoft product doesn't do the snapshot replay. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it does do instrumentation like we do, but it um, but it, it's actually instrumenting every memory read and seeing whether it changed from last time. So it's kind of like a bit like our shared memory implementation, but it's just all the, all the memory was shared. Interestingly, Microsoft had to do that. I was speaking to one of the architects of the product a while ago, and it became clear that they had to do that because Linux has about, well, it's growing all the time, but around 500 different system calls, um, which is like a lot, but not that many. You can cover them. Windows mm -hmm. has thousands, and no one knows what they all do. Right. It's actually not documented what all those system calls do. And they can even change because the Win32 layer gives you the binary. So basically, they can't do what we do and what RR does. They have to do the um, um, you know, power instruction um, uh, 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 checks. But it's, it's you know, that that's a, you know, I just thought an, an interesting technical detail, I think, anyway. But it, it basically is a, you know, it's a really good product, works really well. You should just use that. Now everybody's a little scared since you said no one knows. <laughs> but okay. I mean, that is, it, it's amazing, yeah. But Windows has thousands of system calls, and nobody, even at Microsoft, okay. just, yeah, there's no central documentation of what they all do. It's amazing. All right, and then of course now there is the obvious uh, follow-up question: um, What about Mac support? Yeah, that's so. So that, that like for, for so that technically a lot easier, and there isn't a competing solution on 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 Mac. So that is something. Um, we don't support today um and it's you know just candidly it's not in our short-term roadmap but i would like to think one day um right. we probably would because that's a unix type mm -hmm. system right so it should be it should be supportable yeah. bsd based yeah. yeah all right uh then bastian has another question are there special techniques to determine the position of a snapshot yes so um there are commands you can issue that show you where each of the snapshots are um Generally speaking, like you don't have to. Um, Ninety-nine percent of our users don't even know that snapshots exist, right? Because it's just all hidden. Um, but uh, one of the interesting bits of feedback I got some years ago, talking to a customer, he said, "You've done a really good job hiding the details of like how it works." Um, but please don't, because uh, it, it helps me to know where the snapshots are. Because I can basically, I've got very, very long recordings, and I can navigate through time more quickly if I know where they are. So we actually added some support for advanced. You know, users to like you can list where the snapshots are. You can look at certain. You can actually um, print the values of memory at each snapshot, so that can help you to traverse time. But I would say that's something that, like I say, one percent of our users ever do. I think. Mm -hmm. All right, and then there's one last question. The second part of um, Anton's question, which actually feels like. Um, this is something that you might answer um, in, in half an hour. If you feel it's too much, then please defer it yeah. to the after talk chat. Yeah. So um, I just read what Anton has written. While yeah. working with RR, I got an impression that it linearizes the execution, which makes debugging 
slash reproduction data race is difficult. There seems to be an option to randomize scheduling decisions, but it doesn't always work. Do you have any recommendations on recording slash debugging data race issues? Yeah, yeah. So I think what you're referring to there is um, uh, RR's chaos mode, um, which will, yeah, kind of mm -hmm. randomly like deschedule threads and keep them um, off the CPU for some time to try to kind of re make some of these recognitions reproducible. Um, um, but it doesn't always, um, yeah, it doesn't always work. We have something that's um, uh, similar. Um, we call it thread fuzzing. Um, it's a bit different because, um, again, because we have the instrumentation, because we have the binary instrumentation, it gives us a lot of ability to, it allows us to do a lot of things. And one of the things it lets us do is observe, kind of spot the, um, spot the instructions that are likely to be relate, you know, lock, so locked prefix instructions or memory fences and memory barriers, right? We can spot those kind of instructions and force a thread switch at that point or deschedule for an extended period. So thread fuzzing is is actually pretty effective mm -hmm. at um, allowing the, the, the races to reproduce. But um, the other thing I would say is, is um, uh, patience. <laughs> like, well, so sometimes, I mean, so, uh, and again, I think this is the following information is all public. I'm not, I'm not um, um, but one of our customers is SAP, um, and we use it a lot with the HANA team. Um, and um, um, very multi threaded and, you know, some extremely, you know, I mean, all the, all the shallow bugs were fixed a long time ago. It's very, very, you know, challenging, um, but very, very high reliability requirements, mm -hmm. obviously. And so, mm -hmm. They will run with recording, with thread fuzzing, just like all the time, right? They run their stress test, call it PMAP. They just run that all the time with recording. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, every so often, you know, they find a race condition, they find an edge case. It's sometimes a race condition, sometimes something else, but often it's a race condition. And 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 the, and the recordings will generate and, and then they can debug them. And the point is that uh, compute time is cheap. Right, human time is way more expensive. So, uh, you know, if you need, if you have to run your program for a week with mm -hmm. with recording in order to reproduce that race condition, that's a good trade off, right? Because now I've got a recording and mm -hmm. now I can debug it usually in you know pretty short time at that point. So, um, uh, uh, patience, but you know, there's no getting away from it. There are like there's sort of there's laws of physics here, right? And there's, you know, um, uh, Heisenberg print, uh, and uh, uh, principle and things that if you're measuring something, you're going to change it. And if you've got a race condition that is extremely rare, then you know, and you're perturbing things, and you're perturbing the timings a bit. Mm -hmm. Sometimes maybe it just goes away, and there's just no way for you to capture it under recording. And um, you know, that's 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 kind of tough, but that that that, that does happen. It's true. Yeah. Um, and then you're back to, I don't know, <laughs> yeah, printf or some of the Valgrind um, extensions mm -hmm. to try and find it or something. But yeah. yeah, I think this is what the question was about. Yeah. Okay. And then last question, which is then a nice uh, transition to um, what, what I want to, to remind you of. So uh, Roy is asking, can you speak about your license model? Mm. Or what else? Yeah. Oops. Yeah, so uh, so we kind of we kind of do two products um, that we everything's licensed on a it's a commercial annually recur you know um, uh, annual license um, and it's kind of based on how many developers are licensed to access the technology and then um, um, and for our live recorder there's a there's a platform fee as well so um, um, you know it's kind of it's a commercial offering we do have educational licenses and we do have academic licenses. Um, that depending on exactly what you're doing, you're either steeply discounted or free. Mm -hmm. um, but um, um, yeah, that's in a nutshell. All right, perfect. Then, first oh, of we all, do have a, and we do have a free trial, by the way, as well. There's a 60 day, I think, free trial. You sure. can get it on the yep. website and download it. We should mention this because this is pretty fair, I believe. 60 days mm -hmm. is long. Yep. yep. All right. So then, uh, first of all, thank you very much. This was great. Uh, you see that uh, you actually inspired people a little bit, that there was a lot of questions.